So we come to um, the last session of the day, and um, I'm hoping I did see Mark. I'm hoping Mark's somewhere. Yeah, he's just there. Good. How reassuring. Um, and uh, we're, we're very excited about this keynote session. We've had quite a few sessions on a degenerative cervical myelopathy, and now this is the culmination of the topic today. Um, and you're going to welcome Mark. Good, evening, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to just say a few words before Mark comes in. Mark, Dr. Mark Cotter, he's a fellowship-trained academic neurosurgeon. He did his medical schooling in Austria, but most of his neurosurgical training is in Cambridge. So he, his group made a significant contribution in degenerative cervical myelopathy, including the prevalence, social burden, patient's perspective, pathophysiology, and he has a lot of research on that. He is the CI of RECODE DCM multinational multi-stakeholder trial. And uh, he, it's the first regenerative medicine trial in degenerative cervical myelopathy, as far as I understand. He's also the co-founder of the trustee called myelopathy.org. He, he founded it with another person, Ben Davies. And uh, in his lab has contributed foundational technology and IP to a number of biotech companies. So it's my pleasure to invite Mark Cotter to give his talk on degenerative cervical myelopathy. Thank you for the generous introduction. I'm sorry I'm the last thing in, in, in front of the sort of drinks party later on. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, two thanks to my colleagues. Uh, I'm actually on call this week, uh, but uh, Jibin Francis and Rod Leng allowed me to come here, uh, which I'm very excited about. So the topic, uh, my favorite topic, uh, is degenerative cervical myelopathy. And I'll try and get, take you through a tour de force of various different aspects um, that have changed over the last few years. So these are my disclosures. Um, so degenerative cervical myelopathy. This is obviously a condition uh, that can arise from multiple different spinal conditions. Um, and on the left, you see um, some of these conditions uh, lined out. Um, there are sort of preconceptions um, that uh, we have, um, but actually if you double click on them, um, you find out that a lot of data, a lot of uh, empirical data is missing. We think it's common, but we really don't know how, what the prevalence is. Um, we think it's progressive in many cases. The patients that, I've, that we see uh, in, in our surgeries um, are quite severe. But again, the natural history of this condition is really not very well known. One thing that we don't think is true, but it turns out to be very true, is how disabling this condition is. In fact, I'll come to this, is one of the worst conditions you can have when it comes to uh, quality of life. So let's start with DCM. Why should we call it degenerative cervical myelopathy? Um, when we started out our research uh, about uh, six, seven years ago, um, when um, I started my NIHR um, Clinician Scientist Award, um, lots of different terms were used in the literature to refer to this condition. And here are just a few of them uh, that you're very well aware of. Now, the problem, of course, is if you've got 11 different names for one thing, it's very difficult to, con to convey anything about this thing to your colleagues, uh, to patients, uh, and, and beyond that to, uh, to payers, uh, to healthcare uh, providers. And so we thought we need to tackle this and there needs to be a way of you know, creating a unified uh, brand, a language around this condition. Um, this is really one of the core parts of RECODE uh, which is this international stake, multi-stakeholder initiative. But uh, apart from naming the condition, 
we also set out to define uh, an, a minimum data set. How do we measure? What do we need to know about patients when we enroll them in trials or in clinical practice? And of course also, what's actually important to patients? What are the research questions that we should ask um, in this area? Now, this was a huge initiative. Um, it was supported by the EO. Um, Brian has really been very helpful to sort of get this off the ground. We involved 430 people, nearly 70 countries, 17 specialties. It was a, a monster, to be honest, and it uh, went uh, over years. Um, but here's sort of just a snapshot of how we arrived to the naming. We started very rigorous with systematic reviews. We conducted interviews. We then used the interview inputs to create surveys. From there, we had in, um, prioritization rounds. And then at the end of that, there was a, a, a meeting um, in which we all came together uh, and voted. And at the end of that process, the term degenerative cervical myelopathy came out because it's specific because there was some momentum in the literature, it's easier to understand than, let's say, for example, uh, spondylotic uh, cervical myelopathy. There's a nice abbreviation, DCM, and uh, we felt it's a nice umbrella term for all the different things. But that's, always, that's only sort of uh, our perspective. The most important perspective is this perspective. Um, DCM is the choice of patients. So let's try and use that term to refer to this uh, condition. Um, in order to uh, facilitate also patient wishes. Apart from naming uh, the, the, the condition, um, we also looked at what the research priorities are. And I don't have time into, to go into any detail, but you can see here, this is the James, Lyons, uh, uh, James Lind Alliance project. Uh, we ranked them, we came uh, the 10 uh, most important questions. And the number one question is raising awareness. And we come to why this is such an important thing. This is unique. I don't think any other research priority exercise has brought a non-medical question uh, at the top of the pile, you know, raising awareness. Of course, there are questions around the natural history, diagnosis, treatment, etc., etc. Those are the more obvious ones. So let's start with the natural history. What do we know about DCM? So we know that um, some individuals have symptoms and these symptoms are stable for prolonged periods of time. And then we also know that some patients deteriorate. And uh, big studies, will come to those, have demonstrated if we do surgery, we can stop disease progression and patients improve a little bit. Now, what we don't know is how, you know, how this trajectory are determined. So that's a huge important question. And it's extremely relevant, of course, for treatment uh, decisions. The next thing is, we think it's a common thing. I mean, everyone who works in a spinal center sees these patients, but what is really the size of this problem? Um, and in the literature, there was very little uh, to help us understand uh, what the prevalence or the incidence is. So we tried to triangulate this, uh, and we looked at uh, uh, transactional studies um, using um, MRI scans. So, um, uh, as when the MRI was developed, uh, people got funding to sort of look across uh, uh, different uh, uh, populations, uh, and that gives us, uh, gives us a nice sort of insight uh, on, you know, a large number of patients. Not all studies are very good, so you can see a little bit of a color goat here, but essentially what you can see is that there were Europeans and, uh, and Asian study centers. Um, and one thing that uh, uh, emerged, we're now looking at spinal, the, the prevalence of spinal cord compression, so not myelopathy, uh, in these two uh, um, populations, um, and which is very counterintuitive, the Caucasian populations, uh, um, they seem to be much worse affected in terms of spinal cord compression. Other things that we learned is that spinal cord compression increases over time. Um, that's something that I think everyone could uh, sort of uh, could sense um, that's supported by the literature. The Asian subgroup has a lower incidence, or, sorry, prevalence uh, of, uh, of spinal cord compression. Now, looking across the studies, we could see studies that were looking for healthy individuals. Um, so these are cohorts where the probability that um, people are included with DCM uh, is low. Uh, and then there were, of course, studies as well that looked at, pay, uh, at individuals that had some neurological symptoms. So these were 
high probability uh, DCM uh, cohorts. Um, so if you segregate them, you can see this um, again um, uh, on the scale. Um, and uh, let's look, if you focus on the low pretest probability of DCM, you find that about 2.3% of the adult population, based on this data, may suffer from DCM. Now, how accurate this is, uh, is still uh, to be determined. But what is clear is that this is orders of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude are more frequent than we thought it might be. So the next question then is, OK, this is common. Um, what's the impact of this condition? Um, and uh, one way of looking at the impact of, of a condition is, of course, uh, um, quality of life. Now, when we see patients in our, in our clinic, actually, um, the, the, our, we, we probably fall into that bias trap that, that we just discussed earlier on. Um, they can, most of them can mobilize, maybe they have a stick. And if we compare that, for example, to a transected spinal cord, so traumatic spinal cord injury, we feel, wow, this must be much worse, the traumatic spinal cord injury. Now, if you look at the objective measures, like, such as an SF36 score, um, the astounding thing is it's amongst the worst scores ever measured. So something drives um, down quality of life in these patients that we don't really quite understand yet. And you can also look at how this condition affects the carer. So there's another instrument called the carer qual quality of life. And this is a newer instrument. Uh, but again, we did some uh, comparisons. Well, we, met, we assessed carer qual, and we found it's at the bottom of the pile. There's uh, very few conditions that have ever shown that bad an impact uh, on the carer. So something in this condition uh, really destroys uh, quality of life. Um, there's another way of looking at the impact of a condition, which is survival. And you can see here patients with, uh, uh, with survived myelopathy have a shortened life, uh, lifespan. Um, so another, I think, strong indicator that we're looking at something that's pretty awful. Looking at uh, the economic impact, again, when we started out, there wasn't anything in the literature uh, that allowed us to assess this. So we took a very conservative approach to look at how impactful uh, DCM might be. Um, so we, we used the, um, the um, operative incidents um, in, the, in the NHS databases in, in England to estimate uh, um, the incidence of, of DCM. And then we calculated uh, lost uh, um, uh, payments, cost of admission, uh, lost productivity, disability payments, and this gives you about 700 million pounds per year of lost uh, of, of costs. Um, we'll, we'll come to this uh, in a bit. Um, we think that only a third of the patients eligible for an operation uh, actually get surgery. So probably the costs now are three times that. And if you look a bit deeper in other aspects of the cost structure, it'll increase. Let's translate this, how this, uh, how this would impact the US. Um, conservatively, um, it's 7 billion per year. If you take the non-operative cases, it's more like 20 billion a year. So this is a blockbuster uh, uh, condition, huge. And we, we know about it, the outside world doesn't know about it. The next question, of course, is how does it affect uh, uh, people? And we are very well uh, aware of the symptoms of DCM. Um, ranging from neurological pain symptoms to uh, issues with balance, bladder, etc., etc. But the problem is that there is no characteristic pattern. They're variable. And this means that, that it's actually quite difficult to, to diagnose. Lots of differential diagnoses uh, that play a role. Um, let's just note that. The second thing is, of course, neurological assessments. Um, they're not very often done in the GB practice, um, um, but they also give us uh, a very strong you know, guide towards that. Um, and, uh, and then if you ask patients what affects them mostly, uh, what are their sort of biggest struggles, uh, this is a survey that we've conducted, then we, we, we received uh, feedback that, uh, became, that was completely un, in, unanticipated on my side. Um, they came back and said pain is their biggest problem. So I don't think before doing the surgery, I've ever asked a DCM patient about pain levels. We do this for uh, lumbar radiculopathies, et cetera, uh, but pain seems to be the number one you know, issue with, with these patients. 
pain scores, when you look at the big studies, range between five and six uh, preoperatively. So they are not, uh, they are far away from the extremes that you see in radiculopathy patients. But I, I can imagine that this is one contributor that grinds these patients down. And then, of course, walking function, arm function, bladder, bowel function. These are the classic symptoms that we associate with DCM. Now, coming back to the point that I just made before. When we see these patients in our clinic, we don't know how bad it is. Because they all tell us the same stories, more or less, when they're in the middle to severe range. And this is why the guidelines very strongly uh, state that you have to take a scale. Uh, you have to take the recommended scale at this point is the MJOA scale. Yes, it's flawed, but it gives you a number. And if you don't have a number, you're flying blind. And I'll come back to why this is so important. This is the metrics of clinical decision making at this point in time. It's actually a very quick questionnaire. Four questions, uh, how bad are your hands? Um, how, how bad is your gait, um, how, how numb are your hands, and how bad is your bladder. It takes about 30 seconds uh, once you integrate this into your practice. Now, okay, so now we have these patients um, and uh, they're presenting and we can identify them and we can even grade them. So the next question uh, that I asked was, what happens with these um, in the UK um, before the introduction? of the guidelines. Um, and so this is a local single center study. Um, we created a cohort and looked at that. And we also looked at uh, surveys. So we used, uh, um, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, um, we sort of sparked uh, uh, a little movement uh, with our research interest in, in myelopathy. Um, there's a charity now called myelopathy.org. I think it's the main charity for the event. Thank you for supporting them. The chair is here as well, Helen Wood. Um, so we have a window to patients, we can ask them. So this is a large uh, survey, and I'll just show you one result. So 30% of patients get diagnosed within zero to six months. Why is this important? We come to the data. The earlier you diagnose, the better your outcomes. So, so the 30% that are diagnosed between zero and six months are fine. But look at the other end, 20% take five years plus Another 20% more than two years. That, that is potentially devastating. Now let's look at the um, other data that came out of the survey. The longer you wait for the diagnosis, the worse the condition in terms of your Njoa scale. And this translates into um, increased dependency. So the longer you wait, the higher your probability to be dependent. And the higher your probability to being out of work. So these are very strong arguments for us to get better at diagnosing the condition. And these findings were corroborated by other studies, of course, in the field that also found a correlation between um, poor outcomes and long waits. So why is it that we, we don't diagnose these patients? Why is it that they are stuck in this trajectory? Um, so we thought maybe there's something to do with our knowledge. Is there a knowledge gap amongst health professionals? Um, so we found that we tried to figure out how can we test knowledge gaps? And of course, you know, with all these central exams, um, there are big repositories that people are using uh, to sort of uh, train and, uh, uh, for these exams. So we approached them and we seeded them with myelopathy specific questions. And, and then we looked uh, and looked at the scores of the, you know, hundreds, thousands of participants um, and, and saw how they would uh, fare at the different levels. We start, you know, medical finals, PLAP tests, um, then specialist uh, 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 exams, etc. cetera. And, uh, and you can see here in the middle, this is the myelopathy plot. Actually, theoretical knowledge is above average. On the left, you can see neurology as a whole. This is the neurophobia, uh, the, the individuals, uh, you know, most of, uh, most of the health professionals don't like neurology because it's complex. But actually, when it comes to uh, myelopathy, um, you know, there were, the, the knowledge was, the theoretical knowledge was good. However, when we looked a bit deeper at, at, at different question, um, um, themes of the questions, uh, we found that the presentation, everyone was able to sort of uh, tell us, the, uh, you know, know something about the presentation. But actually, when it comes to workup and specifically management, um, um, the answers were underperforming. So it seems like we have 
we're able to teach people, but they don't know how to translate their knowledge uh, into clinical practice. Okay, so now the next question um, that, uh, um, that uh, we wanted to ask is, what do we know about the pathology uh, of, of DCM? And uh, one astonishing finding was that we knew about this condition for more uh, for, for 100 years, uh, maybe even longer. Uh, the, so this is a, actually a description of, uh, of patients that suffer neurological deficits that we could now call uh, myelopathy. People actually were operating on these patients in, in 1928, um, and they found that uh, things were sticking into the spinal cord, and they said, these are chondromas, tumors. Um, that was corrected pretty soon. 19, uh, a few, a few uh, years later, actually histology analysis showed that it's probably just degenerative disc. And this is what we now know uh, when it comes to spondylactic myelopathy. This is one of the main drivers of pathology. Now, um, with the advance of um, microscopes and electron microscopes, uh, obviously people dug deeper. So this is uh, um, a very important paper out of the 1950s, and you can see here uh, the spinal cord um, is um, on the left is massively impacted by this condition. So this is not a subtle injury. If you look at these spinal cords here, there's gaps, there's uh, vacuoles, there, there, there's loss of tissue, both in the white and the gray matter. The one below is even worse. It lost a lot of substance. So not a subtle condition when it comes to the, the, the pathology. The electron microscope showed us that actually it's not only affecting neurons, so there's axonal loss, there's neurons, it also affects glia. There's uh, demyelination, so loss of myelin sheaths, and remyelination, and we'll come to this. And then some studies in the 60s looking at, uh, at dogs uh, indicated that there might be a vascular deficit. So that's, uh, th that's a really sort of good starting point. Not many studies actually have uh, proven this out since. In fact, it is a systematic review of all scientific literature based on preclinical models in 2017. And we found 50 publications. This compares to 10,000 plus in traumatic spinal cord injury. Um, so this is extremely under-researched area. Some molecular mechanisms uh, are here. I don't want to get into, uh, into, uh, into much details, but you know, cell death may play a role, inflammation, et cetera, et cetera needs more investment if we want to sort of make a difference in terms of treatments. And then, of course, the, uh, and, 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 uh, one of the reasons why people said, we don't need to study this, because it's easy. You know, it's mechanical pressure, pressing on the spinal cord, it's, that's your injury. Uh, it's like a traumatic spinal cord injury. Yeah, that's it. But actually, here's why it's not as easy. First of all, we established about 23% of healthy uh, people have cord compression but only 10%, 2% get myelopathy. So what happens with the sort of 90% that don't get it? So it's not a, a, a linear, it's not a, it's not a direct cause uh, effect relationship. The next thing is astonishing. Um, there is nearly no correlation between the severity of compression uh, and, and disease progression or symptom onset. So, I think this is really, I mean, this is incredible uh, if you think about it. So how can we explain uh, the, this divergence? So you could say, okay, maybe there are particular spine pathologies that drive myelopathy, whereas others don't. Um, so we looked into that as well. Again, we went to our cohort studies, uh, and then what you can do is, of course, some of them describe the, the spinal pathologies that they found in their cohorts. Um, so here you are, you know, it ranges from congenital stenosis to um, multi-level disc pathology, um, single level, uh, level pathology, etc. So this is your baseline. That's your healthy uh, uh, subject uh, uh, cohort, or mainly healthy cohort. And what you can then do is, because there have been some really exciting trials, um, look at the surgical cohorts. Uh, in particular, the EO Spine North America and International Study is an extremely deeply characterized patient cohort. And what you can see now is, how do these pathologies feature in this enriched, pure DCM cohort? And you can see here, some aspects seem to be higher represented. So in particular, 
posterior compression or circumferential stenosis, five times increased. Uh, OPLL, 26 times increased uh, in terms of representation in the symptomatic cohort. Uh, and then multi-level disc uh, uh, compression also slightly increased. Doesn't give us a full answer, but shows that there are some elements that might be more, more important, uh, or more, greater, greater association with DCM. But this all sort of gave us pause, and, uh, and we thought, well, why don't we rethink the whole concept? Um, and this is what uh, we published uh, in, in this study here. This was, again, a really big joint effort uh, of the EOSINE uh, Recode project. Uh, and here's, here's, our, here's our proposal. DCM is really a function of mechanical stress, the vulnerability of the spinal cord, and time. So let's dig the, into this a little bit deeper. So multiple different pathologies can encroach on the spinal cord. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is if you model the spinal cord, it's like a gel. And what happens if you press the gel, as you sort of, in, during the kinetic phase, when you still press, there's an increase in pressure uh, uh, in the gel. But once you then reach a static point, uh, it redistributes and the pressure is gone. So compression, which is the top potential uh, the, on the top, the, uh, the mechanical force on this top, is probably a very transient thing. It probably doesn't play a role because these bulges in the, in the cervical spine normally don't pop out quickly. They sort of grow over time. However, there are other mechanical forces. Every time when we move our necks, and our necks are sort of really very mobile elements. I mean, we want to we use them, not maybe not quite as mobile in, in some of the DCM patients that we see. But anyways, flexion extension, I think, three to six centimeter up and down movement of the, of, the, uh, of the spinal cord. You can see when this rubs against a bar, like an osteophyte bar, this creates tension, and it also creates shear. So we think those are the two mechanical forces that probably play the biggest role in driving this condition. Um, and this is sort of the mechanical stress. Now, the proposed uh, uh, mechanism then is that mechanical stress is the trigger, because as you know, only, only 10% of individuals get the myelopathy. So what are the other mitigation uh, factors? Why does mechanical stress don't translate directly into injury? Well, there's two compensatory mechanisms. One is the resistance uh, to injury. So um, cells have different vulnerabilities. Uh, this is very well known, um, of course, when you think about uh, a traumatic brain, uh, brain injury. Um, things like APOE play, make a difference. Uh, um, a, a mechanism called autophagy, which is the clearing system of cells, can also dictate the vulnerability or the ability to compensate for impact um, various different stresses, uh, in the, in, um, in, in, especially in neurons. So one study that we did was a post-mortem study using uh, DCM tissue, and we found a very beautiful uh, correlation between impairment of autophagy and symptom severity. So it looks like if your repair mechanisms aren't doing very well, then you're more likely to have worse, uh, uh, worse symptoms. The other thing we touched upon is regeneration. This is not often the onset is slow. So if there's regenerative processes going on that compensate for the destruction, again, that could de uh, uh, delay. And then, of course, from the pathology to the symptoms, there's another step. And there are other mechanisms that can compensate for that and create resilience. And these are in the spinal cord, but they can also be within, within the brain. People have looked at uh, uh, you know, compensatory mechanisms in, the brain, in brain scans. So this is sort of um, our framework that we'd like to propose. I think this is true for most patients. There are some very severe uh, uh, compression cases where I think all these thresholds uh, you know, are overcome and then everyone gets DCM and this is what you see in animal models. So what other determinants of vulnerability are there? Um, we looked at genetics. Uh, um, there's not much literature around genetics, but the interesting thing that we found is there are really two groups of genes that pop up. One of them are genes associated with degeneration of the spinal column, actually mostly in the context of PLL, all of them in the, uh, in the context of OPLL. And on the other hand, there are genes that uh, are known to create vulnerabilities uh, in neural tissue. So these are, this is some evidence that genetic mechanisms may play a role. 
Um, that's just the start. Many other things could uh, play a role. Epigenetic mechanisms, age, maybe your uh, gut biome, maybe cardiovascular factors. But I think it's a new way of looking at this condition and identifying risk factors that pe perhaps at some point in time will help us to decide whether someone with mild myelopathy is at risk of deterioration or whether we can sit on him and don't recommend surgery. Okay, let's move on to treatments. What are the treatments uh, for DCM at this point in time? Okay, surgery is effective. This has been borne out by big studies. When you do surgery, most important thing, you stop symptom progression if you do it well. And actually, if you look at the recovery, there is improvement of the MGO score. It's subtle. Uh, most patients aren't uh, you know, delighted with the outcome, uh, but most patients feel that something has changed. Um, on the other hand, when you look at non-operative treatment, there's nothing. There's no, no support for that in the literature. Um, and, uh, and even, I'm a very sort of, I prescribe physiotherapy for nearly all my patients uh, after the operation, but there's nothing in the literature to support this. So this is a meeting that, uh, we, I know I've seen a lot of physios here, we need to change this. Uh, uh, we need to make, create the evidence to support what we think is true, which is that this is beneficial. Now the next question, of course, is okay, we have this hammer, the surgery, who needs the surgery? And, um, and again, this comes back to this question. Some patients deteriorate. When they deteriorate, we can do surgery, but the, the recovery uh, remains incomplete. Um, and we know also that most of the recovery happens in the first six months. So from that perspective, of course, you'd say, oh, the earlier the better, but of course, the problem is some people stay stable at mild disease and then you sub subject them to surgery and they undergo an operation without needing it. And it's not subtle surgery in most cases. Um, so then the question was, how, how does our center, that was before guidelines, actually decide to, to operate uh, on patients? And we sort of created an internal um, cohort using MRIs and tracked them through the medical system. And one thing that we were uh, finding again was no correlation between symptom severity and MRI parameters. Um, but interestingly, MRI compression was the dominant reason why surgeons recommended uh, surgery. So that's a little bit counterintuitive. So what do, what do the guidelines say? So I've been, um, uh, I had the pleasure to be involved also in the guideline process uh, headed by Michael Feelings. Brian also, of course, uh, an important member of this process. Um, and uh, we all came together to sort of create the first outline uh, of how we should approach DCM. Now the EO uh, guidelines uh, recommend that we do not operate on individuals that have asymmetric uh, spinal cord compression. If we did that, you could operate on 80% of people at the age of 80. I don't think that's, that would lead to anything good, to be honest. Um, so I think this is, a, this, is a, this is a tick. Mild DCM, that's the difficulty of the cohort. Some subtle fig, uh, you know, numbness in their fingers, maybe some increased uh, urinary urgency. Here, you, know, you can see we became very sort of, we, we came a little bit more, um, let's say, more optional uh, in terms of treatment either surgery or um, a um, structured non-surgical uh, uh, approach. Structured in that because we wanted to make sure that we don't discharge these patients, because these are the ones that we don't know where they're heading. Of course, when they are deteriorating, uh, then we need to do surgery. And the sooner we detect the deterioration, the better for the patient. And moderate and severe um, myelopathy, of course, um, these are surgical candidates. So, surgery is one way to halting disease progression. Are there other ways to improve outcomes? Um, maybe by optimizing surgery. And one of the things that I found really astounding when I started to really dig into this, um, it's nearly now 10 years ago, uh, was that there was tons of studies looking at different surgical options. The prototypical study was a uh, observation um, you know, that surgeons published, and they were comparing anterior versus posterior surgery. There are hundreds of these studies, and the outcome was always the same. It doesn't make a difference. 
So it's weird. We're trying to do the same thing over and over again, expect something different. I think Einstein said that's madness. Anyways, thankfully, this trial was uh, conducted now, which was a randomized controlled trial looking exactly that question. And uh, we, I have, don't have time to dig into that trial deeper, but it's a fantastic study design um, that sort of get, got patient enrolled. And the outcome was, doesn't make a difference uh, when it comes to, sorry, um, in f functional outcomes. It does make a difference when it comes to side effects. Um, yes, if you go from the front, you have higher levels of dysphagia and dysphonia, um, but these are mainly transient. So um, that's the evidence basis. Of course, there are pockets where we don't really yet know what the best uh, treatment is. And one pocket here is, you know, whether we, need, whether we can get away with laminectomy only or whether we want to have laminectomy infusion. Um, and, uh, of course, um, if you look at uh, WFNS, they say, we don't know. The evidence base is not there to recommend any particular posterior approach. Um, we looked at the AO uh, study data and compared laminectomy patients with laminectomy infusion patients. Now, huge caveat, this international study with 780 patients plus only had 22 patients with laminectomy only. So that's uh, maybe not quite representative of what we see in the UK. Um, but nevertheless, there seems to be a huge difference between laminectomy and laminectomy infusion. If you look at the Swedish outcome data, which is a registry study, there is no difference. And uh, because adding fusion and fixation is cost uh, and, uh, and, and also um, is much more complex surgery, the NIHR has commissioned a trial, uh, which we've called the Polyfix trial, which really studies that. What's the difference in terms of outcome of laminectomy versus laminectomy infusion? Um, very simple trial design. We randomize patients. Uh, into laminectomy or laminectomy infusion. Extraordinarily, we were so scared about enrollment and what patient would say. Actually, if you're honest, I don't know. We don't know. Which one is better? Um, can you help resolve this question? Patients are happy to do so. Very rarely, one dropout who, who changed their mind, who wanted a particular procedure versus another procedure. We need 400 patients. Um, we randomize uh, according to MJOA because severity has impact on outcomes and sites. And we've just passed the pilot. So I think we've passed the pilot because uh, that is a decision that the trial steering committee uh, needs to make. Uh, we, we are sort of uh, recruiting very well, and, uh, but we need to recruit better. Uh, we've dropped off the idea line, so we need you, anyone who is interested to, to join this trial. It's a very pragmatic trial. Uh, please reach out to us. would love to have more centers involved. Now, what I'm not saying is that any surgery is good for anyone. In fact, I think what we know is if you do the right surgery, it's, it has the same effect. And what that means is that it's on us to optimize the surgery and individualize it. So this is really a case of uh, you know, precision medicine. It's not one cookie-cutter approach. Uh, I think which is important. Uh, yeah. Perfect. So, um, can, is there anything else we can do? Novel treatments. Um, so, um, there are other, there's a review article that came out of this. In order to improve outcomes, neuroprotection, neuromodulation, and neuroregeneration are potential avenues. So, the difference is that neuroprotection tries to hold disease progression. Uh, regeneration tries to restore it, and neuromodulation tries to improve symptoms as they are. Lots of different trials going on at the moment. I'll just talk about two. Rilazole is a neuroprotective agent, has been trialed, and failed its primary endpoint. Unfortunately, no impact on outcomes in terms of function. Maybe a signal in the pain cascade. The second trial is RECEDE, which is, uh, again, a trial that's ongoing right now in the UK. The idea was that... Um, the thing that drives uh, re recovery seems to be axonal connectivity and remyelination. Um, and this comes from animal data, but plus some of the human data that I've already demonstrated. And the interesting thing is those two uh, re regenerative responses use the same molecular machinery. Um, so we can target the, with, with the same drug. And um, so this is phosphodiesterase 4. 
There's also a study that came out, if you target an other isoform, block it, you can actually prevent the onset of DCM in rat models. So we were looking for mice, sorry, for drugs uh, that, uh, that have dual effects, that can block both isoforms. And we, we show gold. Um, Medicine Nova has a drug called Ibudilast. It's been in use in, for Jap in Japan for decades for different conditions. It's been developed for many other neurological conditions. It's extremely safe, and we've been able to sort of get access to the drug. The idea is that it might improve outcome uh, in the context of surgery. We've asked patients what the priorities are, as I said. We have a dual outcome here, a pain measure, and, uh, and the functional measure, because this mechanism can actually modulate both, uh, both data elements. Um, and again, it's a randomized controlled trial. It's the first regenerative medicine trial. Um, it's happening in the UK, not in the US, uh, which is also great. Uh, and again, we've just passed uh, the threshold of recruitment, of recruitment for the internal pilot. Um, big shout out to myelopathy.org, who found the funding to enable us to continue this trial. And again, we're looking for centers that want to um, contribute to this trial. And with this, I'm going to close. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. So, um, we, we have, Mark, you're very welcome to come and take the weight off your feet. Uh, we have got five minutes for questions. The microphones are in the middle there and at the end there. So, if, if a couple of people would like to line up, we'll take this question on the left first, please. When you looked at your ranking of symptoms, you, or what was important to patients, at the bottom of your initial slide was sexual function. Have you noticed a difference between more elderly patients and younger patients with those symptom order? Yeah, I, I think we don't have very clear data because it, it's an age-related condition. So there are not many people that are young, but I think this is a very good explanation of why you know, this ranks uh, lower uh, in this cohort. Thank you very much. A brief well, question there, you. please. A lovely talk. I'm proud you. Of At what point, uh, you decide that progression is enough to intervene because it's so slow, they find very difficult to pinpoint whether it is worth. So you see after six months, they're not sure. How you decide is now the time. Yeah, I think this is a very important question because you will see that patients tell you uh, they're much worse uh, or, they, or they are the same. And actually, you don't know. And it seems like you know, their experience is also um, changes from a day-to-day -day basis. There's a lot of symptom variability. So the way that I do this is very cut, cookie cutter style. I do an MJOA score. If the MJOA score is, uh, drops by a point, it's a deterioration. And actually, interestingly, through the, you know, there's a lot of noise when you sort of hear how patients describe their condition, but the MJOA score gives you a really good and a pretty solid reference point. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Well, that's what I do essentially. I, look at, uh, I just look religiously uh, on the MJOA score. Thank you. Uh, Julia, can I have your question, please? Yeah, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I really love your pathophysiology formula. I wonder if it's even more multifactorial than that, and there's still so much that we don't know. And I wonder if that could help to guide treatment, because it might be that some people have a less resilient cord because it's less viscoelastic, because they didn't take HRT during menopause, for instance, or they're obese, or they're alcoholic, or they have a really unhealthy lifestyle. So just a gentle suggestion that we should perhaps take a very whole person approach in our treatment. It's not just about surgery or physio or regenerative medicine, but it's also about advising people to take HRT, lose weight, be healthier, treat the diabetes, whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, I think it provides a thinking frame work, which we can now use to interrogate uh, risk factors. Um, some of those seem to be correlated. So uh, diabetes patients seem to have, you know, a different, um, uh, you know, profile in terms of treatment response. Um, uh, and, and I imagine that many other factors play a role. But I'm always very hesitant if we just use it to project our own thoughts into this. I think we need to create the evidence that then allows us to make, uh, you know, th those kind of recommendations. But uh, yes, I think it's um, from 
when we look at our patients, we should look at them from a holistic perspective. Thank you. Mark, two more questions. We've got Thank time you. for one there and there. Uh, hi. It's the other side. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you think this pathology is a slow vascular event? We're talking about compression, but actually, I mean, if you read literature, a lot of talk about slow vascular event affecting the spinal cord. And that explains the lack of correlation between what you mentioned, the scan images and the symptoms of the patient. And possibly this is a continuous, slow perfusion of the spinal cord. Yeah. So I think you make a really good point. There's a, a lot of literature in the 60s, 70s, 80s that suggests that there's something going on with the vasculature. Uh, nothing else since uh, has been looked at. Um, and uh, I think we need to look into this much deeper. Mm -hmm. I think Thanks. one last question. Lovely, lovely talk, Mark. Um, uh, this goes into the kind of squeaky bum territory of the asymptomatic young patient that's clearly got the cord compression, that still wants to go skiing, play rugby, do things that make you twitch a little bit. Um, the MJOA hasn't changed. There's no, nothing there essentially. Have we got? Any, have you got any data? Is there data on cord injury in that in that subgroup and? What would be your advice on how we counsel, having seen the, the massive panoply of data that, that you have? Yeah, I, I think you, you're absolutely right. This is, a, this is a very difficult situation sometimes, especially when the spinal cord is uh, very compressed. Um, so I'll talk about this tomorrow a little bit. Um, there's not much data out there. Um, there is a Taiwanese um, you know, national repository um, that ha looked into the question as to whether, whether there's increased risk uh, of a spinal cord injury. And uh, they found, of course, a significantly increased risk of spinal cord injury in the context of compression. Maybe, I, I think that it was about four times higher. But spinal cord injury itself is such a rare event that actually that doesn't um, um, make a big difference. So it's, very, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult uh, um, um, situation. Um, I think m my approach would be to monitor, educate, make sure they don't do any wild things, and have discussions with them, multiple discussions, to, um, in order to get to a point where you, know, you can make a joint decision. I think involvement of patients in decision making is a really key thing. We talked about patient involvement in research. I think on a day-to-day -day basis, when we treat patients, uh, we should interact with them and make them a part in our decision. Mark, I'm, I'm afraid all we've got time for now is to uh, show our appreciation for your keynote. So once more, thank you very much, Mark.